morning. My name is Tatiana Mironova. I'm a member of uh, Place of Art uh, project, and we are here today um, continuing our mini conference called Exhibition as a Means of Analysis of Contemporaneity, Ethics and Politics of the Exhibition. And uh, this is the part of a bigger conference called uh, Theories and Practices of Contemporary Art and Design. Um, organized by uh, the School of Art and Design uh, in a uh, higher school of economics in Moscow. And we are here today with uh, Natalia Smolyanska, uh, artist and curator, and also the head of seminar Place of Art. So, hello, Natalia. Hello. And I'm glad to um, introduce our guest, Natalia Prihodko. Uh, who is a researcher and art critic based in Paris. Uh, also, she's now working on her PhD thesis in, at the School for Advanced Studies uh, in the Social Sciences um, in Paris. Uh, so uh, glad to see you here, Natalia. Hello, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> uh, and Natalia is here today with the report um, uh, human relations to the world uh, and the problem of displaying dispositive case study of sun and sea, uh, Marina. Uh, I now give the floor metaphorically to Natalia. Uh, please, you can start. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to speak about uh, this problem of display, displaying dispositive because it's uh, in the heart of the exhibition practices. And uh, here in this context, I understand uh, the display dispositive uh, as a material configuration um, of the space. So including the spatial structure, the architecture, uh, but also a system of relations that uh, this uh, material physical configuration uh, creates and generates. So uh, why is this question of the dispositive of display um, is important? Um, because uh, I think that uh, the relations uh, we are taken in as spectators, uh, they have this uh, capacity to shape our relation to the world. And as uh, Ernst Gombrich said, for example, well, he was not the only one to say it, but he was one of the first to note it, that there is no uh, innocent eye, as he said. It means that the way we approach the world, uh, the way we approach uh, new things, new phenomena, we don't know yet, they are highly dependent uh, on our previous experience and uh, on our previous knowledge. And uh, at the modern time, uh, our... Um, uh, contact with the world is more and more mediated by different types, different kinds of uh, displaying dispositives. And in the modern time, our experience as spectators becomes more and more frequent and uh, intense. So in other words, uh, today uh, and since uh, the beginning of the modernity, we relate to the world most of time as spectators. Uh, so that's why I wanted to speak about this topic and I wanted to discuss it um, uh, uh, using one uh, case, one artwork. Uh, this is the uh, work Sun and Sea Marina, which was uh, presented at the Lithuanian pavilion of uh, the last uh, Venice Biennale. Uh, and uh, this work uh, has been analyzed a lot from the point of view of its critics of uh, Anthropocene and ecological issues. So I would like to concentrate more on its displaying dispositive because I found it very striking. And uh, actually, uh, I would like just to share some uh, thoughts that uh, my experience as spectator of this work uh, inspired. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, what is this um, dispositive? So I will show you uh, some pictures. So this is how uh, uh, it looked. 
the spectator uh, entered uh, the site of the Venetian Arsenale, so the industrial site, one of the buildings of uh, this site. And uh, the building uh, had two levels. Uh, the spectator found himself on the upper level, a sort of uh, mezzanine surrounding this um, uh, room where the performance took place. Um, and the viewer could see uh, the performance uh, so taking place in the room uh, uh, below. Uh, men and women in beach wear seen while lying on this beach uh, created uh, inside this building. And uh, I can also uh, show two short videos. Okay, at the second uh, video, where you can uh, uh, have a better view of the dispositive. So this artwork is uh, simultaneously an opera, an installation, and a pavilion. Uh, so uh, it uh, recalls some traditional uh, display and dispositives specific to the Western culture. So for example, opera makes think about theater, installation about uh, museums and galleries or art exhibitions, and uh, pavilion could also remind some uh, uh, dispositives used for non-artistic exhibitions as well, such as universal exhibitions, for example. And this artwork claims the legacy of all this uh, traditional, uh, in Western culture, traditional dis uh, display dispositives. But what I found interesting is that it also subverts them. Uh, it uh, tries to overcome them. And so I would like to show how it happens, uh, considering three points of view, or three points, sorry. So the first point is uh, viewing position as uh, power position. Occupying uh, two levels, uh, this uh, installation uh, puts the spectator at the top of the whole spatial structure. So his point of view, the point of view of the spectator is a kind of zenith point of view on the performance. And such uh, spatial uh, configuration uh, actually takes form of a um, visual pyramid uh, with the spectator on the top of it. And this notion of visual pyramid um, uh, sends us to the tradition of the linear perspective, which is also a specific type of visual apparatus, uh, well developed uh, the Renaissance. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, legacy of linear perspective is claimed here and uh, it is used in uh, the painting, which is like one of the main media of uh, the Western art, but also in the theater because the Italian theater is uh, rooted in the same principles and the same research as uh, the one which led to the linear perspective in the painting. And in the Italian theater, the stage, the scene, is uh, conceived as a kind of cage which captivates the gaze of the spectator. So uh, in these uh, dispositives, um, 
uh, the spectator's point of view appears as a kind of center and the purpose uh, of the whole picture. Uh, it subordinates uh, the uh, picture's construction. And this is, of course, uh, a purely anthropocentric point of view. Um, Sun and Sea uh, affirms this power of the human gaze, uh, of the spectator's gaze, but at the same time, it subverts this power. So how does it happen? Uh, actually, by this vertical uh, structure. Uh, in uh, uh, the case of paintings, or in the case of the theater, the spectator is situated in front of the picture, in front of the stage, but here, the authors of this work, they somehow turn this visual pyramid 90 degrees and um, the um, frontal uh, position um, is replaced by a vertical one. Uh, so this vertical uh, uh, dispositive uh, is a kind of elucidation of this uh, superiority of the human gaze. It could also be seen uh, as a kind of allusion to the God's gaze, to the God's point of view, who would see the world from above, from heaven. Uh, uh, so uh, there is some kind of domination of superiority here. But on the other hand, this very position um, limits the area of uh, visibility of the spectator. Uh, here, for example, uh, when you are at the top of, um, uh, when you are above uh, the scene, uh, you cannot see the whole uh, so-called scene at one at one, uh, at one glance. Uh, for example, when you are standing in front of a picture or when you are in the theater in front of the stage, you can see the whole stage, the whole picture. It's not the case here. And um, in the picture, uh, nothing, or in the theater, nothing escapes from the human, uh, from the spectator's gaze, because the picture has a frame, uh, the theater has uh, curtains, which uh, limit clearly uh, the uh, borders of the represented world. So nothing escapes uh, from the spectator's gaze. Here, there are no real frame, even if the building frames the architecture of this building frames somehow somehow the performance this so-called stage but it's not the real stage it's not the real scene uh, there are no real uh, curtains so we don't know uh, if the performance continues or not uh, in the areas we cannot see from our point of view we don't know neither whether the performance continues or not when the performers leave uh, this room because they enter, they leave uh, sometimes. And so this very vertical position actually makes uh, escape the performance from uh, the spectator's gaze. So uh, the performance escapes from the power of uh, his visual possession. Uh, the second point I wanted to discuss is the spectated bodies. So like uh, in uh, the classic theater, uh, the dispositive of the work Sun and Sea separates the so-called scene uh, from the space uh, reserved for the public, for the spectators. And such, such separation uh, generates two different uh, realities, two different physical and bodily realities with the, their own behavior patterns. And these two realities do not cross necessarily. From, uh, so on the one hand, um, uh, there are bodies on the so-called scene uh, whose actions and movements are subordinated to the task of representation. On the other hand, uh, the bodies of those who came to enjoy the representation and their movements and actions are defined by the goal of getting pleasure of the performance. So this uh, separation between these two realities creates a kind of rupture, uh, creates a kind of desolidarization of these uh, bodily experiences. And also it leads to a fictionalization of the bodies on the so-called scene. So for example, as a, uh, when we are in the theater, we know that 
actually everything is happening on the scene is not for real. So if uh, actors, uh, performers are suffering, if they are dying, it's not for real. So it's a kind of fictionalization. Um, and uh, this desolidarization uh, has uh, important consequences when this, um, with the coming of the industry of uh, mass entertainment, uh, when live performances uh, start to function as entertaining shows, so they start to become, they become um, an object of consumption, uh, among other objects of consumption. And it means that all the elements involved into the performance, into the show, they also start to be perceived as objects of consumption, including the bodies of the performers. And in the beginning, uh, with the appearance of theater, uh, for example, uh, the representation already had a kind of symbolic seizure uh, over the performance, performers' bodies. Uh, as I said, their actions, movements are subordinated to the task of the representation. But uh, when these uh, li uh, live performances are taken into the conditions of uh, this uh, uh, industry of mass entertainment, into the capitalist conditions of mass entertainment, uh, so this symbolic seizure of the, the bodies uh, transforms into real physical, physical possession of them. And two extreme uh, examples of this could be uh, the connection between the theater and the prostitution, and on the other hand, the phenomenal so-called uh, uh, human zoos. So how does uh, the work Sun and Sea overcome this relation? Again, by concentrating the feeling of power and domination provided by the, wo uh, by the works dispositive. Um, uh, I come back to this picture. Uh, so, spectators watch the performance from above and this position gives the impression of uh, power and control. And that is also why uh, the performer, performers' bodies uh, appear suddenly is very fragile and vulnerable. Uh, so, uh, this is one of possible points of view. So uh, the spectator, uh, when he feels, when he starts to perceive these bodies as fragile and vulnerable, he also realizes his position of uh, uh, domination. Uh, but this, uh, the consciousness of this uh, could also bring him to the awareness that the fact of the fragility and vulnerability of these bodies only exist in relation to himself. It means that without the conditions of exhibition, uh, which make uh, these bodies spectated bodies, and without the position, the whole exhibition displaying dispositive assigns to the spectator, actually they are not uh, vulnerable and fragile. And uh, the last uh, point I wanted to discuss is the question of nature, relation uh, to the nature. Uh, I come back to uh, this picture. Uh, so uh, the work, um, uh, let us see uh, this artificial beach, uh, which was created here with the sand brought uh, outside uh, of Venice, so uh, yeah, it was brought apparently from the surroundings of, uh, surroundings of Vilnius, as uh, the official Instagram uh, of uh, the uh, pavilion says. Uh, so it um, consists uh, of reminding us a certain tradition of uh, greenhouses or colonial exhibitions which use the same principles of the same uh, type of relation to nature. Uh, so it means um, an extraction of nature's elements or species uh, from their organic environment uh, to transport them to a new constructed context. And this context uh, is the one available, first of all, to the Western spectator. Well, now I speak about the whole tradition of uh, the Western uh, uh, 
uh, displaying these positives uh, showing uh, nature in this way. Um, in the Western culture, nature uh, is transformed into landscape most of the times. Uh, it means uh, a constructed nature. Landscape is a construction of nature. And uh, the nature is, is not so much appreciated as an undivided ecosystem, uh, which constitutes the vital source, the vital environment uh, for human being. But uh, the nature is approached more as a kind of object in vitro, available for human use. Uh, within such dispositives as uh, uh, greenhouses or colonial exhibitions, uh, the nature is also transformed into a kind of show. And uh, Sun and Sea does it too, but uh, it gives a sad, ironic and dismal show. So this is a w the way it subverts uh, the legacy of such uh, dispositives. Uh, <clears throat> and here we can see that uh, the original urge uh, to unite with nature uh, the original uh, uh, search for nature is source of peace and rest. And you could uh, hear in one of the video fragments I, I've shown, the singers uh, speak about uh, this uh, vacation time, go to, to the sea. So this search for a transcendent experience the nature could provide here turns into its opposite confinement and concentration of bodies and landscape uh, inside a former industrial site. So it's all, it's sad and uh, ironic. So uh, the work Sun and Sea uh, claims the legacy of some traditional uh, displaying dispositives of the Western culture as I said, but at the same time, it presents a critical reemployment of this uh, legacy. Uh, so, on the one hand, uh, Sun and Sea uses such operations as separation, extracting, transporting from the original environment to the artificial one, framing the object of display to better serve uh, it to the spectator's gaze. So, these operations, which are uh, like in the heart of the traditional Western display and dispositives. And uh, these operations generate uh, the attitude of power, domination, and even possession. But on the other hand, uh, the work Sun and Sea subverts them, as I said, as I tried to show, and it does it by pushing these attitudes to a certain extremity, to a certain limit, and uh, that's how it overcomes them. And here I should make uh, an important precision uh, because I speak about these attitudes of power, domination, and possession. Uh, so I spoke of them as inherent uh, to the mentioned display and dispositives. But uh, I should precise that they have not always been active within them. Um, so initially, such attitudes could be present in the inner logic of uh, these displaying dispositives, but at the same time, they could also stay, stay latent and non-instrumentalized. But they reveal themselves and uh, they start uh, uh, acting and operating only under certain circumstances. And first of all, once these display and dispositives are taken into the conditions of industrial, capitalist, and colonial modernity. So, uh, again, um, uh, the origin of all these display and dispositives could lie in the positive values of learning and admiring uh, the living world. Uh, so, for example, uh, they could allow to see what is normally hidden from our view uh, in everyday life, to appreciate some singular performances, uh, to observe and study, to better understand what is yet unknown to us, and so on. So, the question uh, which is important for me here is how do they shift from these initial values to the relation of domination and uh, exploitation? 
So obviously the, fur the further investigation uh, of this question could start uh, with uh, analyzing the institutional frames, uh, the history of uh, ideological, socio-political, or economic use of these dispositives. But I would like to conclude with uh, another question. What is the role of the spectator uh, in this shift? So if the act of displaying, of uh, exhibiting, uh, conveys a relation of power and possession, which is, as I showed, embedded into the displaying dispositives, the spectator actually is not exterior to it. The exhibitions exist for the spectator. And the display and dispositive uh, create a specific space and they also assign a specific type of behavior for the spectators. So when uh, a spectator takes part uh, in a display and dispositive, he in a way approves its existence. So by going to a theater or to an exhibition, the spectator is already taken into the relations this dispositive creates. And the further question could be uh, how the spectator deals with the situation uh, he's taken in. Does he accept it? Uh, does he reject or criticize it? Does he reflect on it? Does he try to transform it uh, in one way or another? So I think uh, this, this work, Sun and C, urges us to realize our role and our responsibility as spectators. And uh, the dispositive of this artwork reveals the position of the spectator and its challenges. Uh, it also reveals the fact that the spectator has a constituent role in uh, the existing exhibition practices and also in the forms uh, of displaying. So thank you. Thank you, Natasha, for a very um, interesting report, and uh, thank you for displaying your methodolo <laughs> sorry, methodological approach, because I think that it is very important for us, especially. And uh, now uh, I think we have some questions, so Natalia, can you start? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I admire the way you show how the division of space creates uh, these oppositions, allowing you to identify the political, social, and environmental uh, context, all of which are interconnected. Uh, this indeed is an amazing statement in its integrity and power. And my question is, uh, do you know any examples uh, that preceded this principle of solving space in any other curatorial projects? Well, I think uh, this uh, problem of the division between the stage and the public space uh, was in the heart of all the experimentations in the theater uh, during the 20th century. And uh, there are different uh, positions uh, that are like uh, there were two main points uh, um, two main methods uh, suggested as a way to overcome this division and uh, for example um, Jacques Rancière uh, spoke about it in his book uh, Spectateur Emancipé uh, he said there is uh, on the one hand uh, uh, in kind of activating the uh, so-called passive position of the viewer, uh, the cruelty theater by Antonin Artaud, or the other, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, creating the performance as a kind of, uh, well, breaking with the codes, with the traditional codes of the performance of the stage. So it creates another um, experience. Uh, it relates to the spectator in a different way. Uh, so this is the, for example, the theater of uh, Brecht. Uh, so I'm not a specialist in the theater, so that's why I wouldn't go further into this question. But uh, this is obviously one of the main issues in, uh, in, in theater, in, in art. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can find some other examples uh, in uh, history of exhibitions, uh, other examples of overcoming this division. Well, in, ex in the exhibitions, it's different because um, we have uh, objects, installations, uh, works on the walls, uh, but uh, the artistic institutions also 
assign a certain type of behavior, a certain type of uh, uh, interaction uh, when uh, the spectators are situ uh, situated inside them. Uh, so there could also be some uh, ways to s uh, overcome them, for example, different uh, performers uh, like uh, Jean-Jacques Lebel, uh, no, uh, he's called Jean-Jacques, no? Jean-Jacques mm -hmm. Lebel uh, yes. in, in, in France, uh, who uh, tried to shock the public. Uh, um, so this could be some examples. But what I found interesting in this work, uh, Sun and Sea, is that uh, it doesn't try to, to shock uh, the spectator. It doesn't try to impose a kind of uh, different type of behavior or a different uh, itinerary. So the spectator is calm. He does what he wants. But uh, the, the dispositive actually activates some uh, consciousness of the spectator's responsibility. And that, uh, that's what I found interested uh, in this work. And I think anyway, um, the problem of this division um, is very different in theater and the artistic institutions. So what is interesting here is that they emerged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have a second question. Uh, the performance, uh, as far as we know, usually has a scenario. Is this scenario also built uh, on oppositions? And how well is it related to the very nature of the chosen dispositive? No. Uh, well, the, I'm not sure there is a real scenario or there is a libretto that the spectators could read. Uh, they were uh, present uh, in the space for the public. Uh, it is also available on the website, uh, so everyone could, could read it and follow uh, like the storyline. And there were like some lines uh, that could be identified, for example, I don't know, some, I think some philosophers uh, speaking about uh, this uh, uh, issue of going to vacation, of relating to nature. Then a, a woman speaking about uh, her husband. Well, there were some storylines. But at the same time, uh, it's not a real scenario with the beginning and with the end because everyone could uh, enter at any time or any moment of the performance and could leave at any time too. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, this, I think this uh, uh, free structure of the libretto uh, went well with this free uh, space for spectators deambulation for spectators movement they could like go around on this mezzanine uh, changing their point of view uh, yeah so I, I really liked in this work this uh, freedom uh, given to the spectator but at the same time it was captivating thank you so now uh, I have some questions too uh, and the first one is um, uh, when you told about the responsibility of the spectator, um, I wondered uh, when uh, when the audience uh, started feeling uh, started uh, becoming aware of, of their position. Um, did they uh, try to somehow interact with the um, with the performers uh, by I don't know by throwing something or by any other kind of interaction or it's just uh, taking photos and uh, observing what is happening in the world. Yeah, so uh, when I spoke about these three points, it's what came to my mind uh, from my own experience as spectator. So obviously other people could have a different experience of this uh, work. But I think, and I found it, uh, I felt it as something very powerful, as very strong impression. The, that's why I wanted to speak about the dispositive because it generated, it activated uh, this um, awareness of uh, the spectator's position. And this is precisely this like vertical structure. As you say, when we are 
overlooking, overhanging the space of uh, the performance. Yeah. And when we are literally above the bodies of the performers, uh, you really feel this position of, uh, of domination. And uh, here comes all this uh, awareness, actually. At, at least it came uh, to me um, at that point. The main interaction was obviously filming, taking picture. Uh, that's why I spoke about this power of visual possession. So everyone wanted to, to possess these images, this uh, part of the experience. And the point of view provided by the work to the spectator was just perfect for, for it. So no one in front of you, like in Lura, in front of Mona Lisa. So you like have the whole uh, uh, view on uh, the performance. But at the same time, as you say, um, I also had this uh, uh, thought, but actually how the performers are uh, protected if someone wants to throw uh, from something from above, it could hurt them. And it uh, made me think about uh, like some <laughs> old traditions in the Western theater when public was not uh, glad, uh, was not happy with the performance that they could uh, throw uh, some, uh, I don't know, tomatoes and eggs uh, to the actors. But uh, in the case of the theater, it was frontal dispositive. So they were in front one of another. So the actors could see the public as the public could see the actors. So the actors had the possibility to hide at some point. Here it's not the case because yeah, they can look um, uh, up, but they can also uh, not be able to see what's happening uh, above them. And so that, that's how came this idea and this uh, feeling of fragility of people uh, which are below actually. And I think it was uh, made consciously because I have seen some pictures of um, uh, the same work, which was uh, uh, presented in a different uh, uh, place after the uh, Biennale. Uh, and some elements were changed by this vertical dispositive state. So it's like essential for this work. Thank you. Um, and I have a second question, maybe not a question, but uh, some thoughts. Um, I, uh, um, when, I, um, when I saw uh, the pieces of this performance, um, I, uh, I, felt, um, I felt kind of anxiety because of the uh, hybrid uh, form of this work. So as you told, it's something between opera, installation, exhibition, pavilion, and uh, um, what do you think, should we, should we uh, talk about this hybrid form or um, should we like um, see what belongs to opera, what belongs to exhibition and how it all uh, connected together and how it influences, I don't know, somehow it influences the position of the spectator, or it's just the effect uh, that um, artists and composers and all other participants decide this work to be like that, and um, and that's all. You've told a little bit about uh, the traditions of theater and pavilions, but can you stress uh, a bit uh, this uh, this uh, complex form of this work? Yeah, I think this is essential uh, and it's uh, uh, what makes this effect uh, the most uh, efficient, I think. Um, as I mentioned uh, quickly, um, all these dispositives uh, have something in common in their roots. For example, when I spoke about the linear perspective, I said quickly that uh, the uh, Italian theater is uh, directly related to the linear perspective as a visual apparatus of the painting. So uh, as they are all developed within the Western culture, obviously there are, there are some common grounds. And then uh, they uh, were developed inside specific uh, institutions. So today when we speak a lot about uh, pluridisciplinarity and so on and so forth, uh, obviously, these borders between the uh, disciplines um, disappear. And so this work, I think, uh, by merging all these uh, types of display and dispositives, 
uh, also activated all the questions they could uh, uh, pose and um, all these problematic issues. So I, th I think it's very important and uh, um, very often uh, in answers to the uh, demand for pluridisciplinarity comes just as moving, for example, theater into exhibition space, or I don't know, inviting a visual artist to create decoration for theater, so like moving one from another. Uh, what they did, uh, the authors of this work, uh, they didn't just move something uh, from one context to another, but they really like merged it. So they really like merged the structure of all these dispositives. Uh, and um, I think it is an interesting way uh, to, to think about the real interdisciplinarity. And uh, yeah, as a way to overcome the limits and the problems uh, appeared uh, inside these traditional dispositives. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the answer and uh, thank you for the report uh, in general. Uh, so if we don't have any questions, I think we can finish. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you.